Hello. Hello, everyone out there. I'm Stephen Ginsborg. I'm a GP in Northern Sydney, and I'm your facilitator for tonight. And welcome to the um, about 1,800 participants or registrants who will be joining us for tonight's webinar, Culturally Responsive Healthcare for Older Australians. And uh, there will be viewers, as I say, who will be watching the recording because they can't be with us here tonight. I'd also like to say a special welcome to the members of the Sydney North Older Persons Mental Health Network, of which I'm a co-coordinator, and to other networks around Australia who are meeting tonight with us to watch this broadcast. MHPN currently supports five older persons mental health networks across the country. And I'm pleased to report that a sixth network will launch in South Australia next month. And details of these networks and how to join them will come to in the closing slides. And as we are meeting by webinar, uh, we can't greet the person sitting next to us as we usually would. So while we wait a few moments for others to join us, we might like to find the chat box and I'll find that for you. I'll show you the, um, I'll move that slide across. There we go, open the chat box. Find that chat box and uh, say whatever you want. It can just be hello and where uh, we're from. And I'll just say, because I don't have access to that particular chat box, that I'm in North Sydney on Gamma Regal country. So you've got the um, navigation buttons there for the functions, which are all pretty self-explanatory. Um, the exit survey is accessible by way of the yellow icon, or as a pop-up at the end of the webinar, so we'll come to that uh, when we come to it. Um, by registering, I have to tell you that you've automatically agreed to the ground rules which can also be found in the Supporting Resources tab. Also, by way of registration, participants were asked to submit a question, and we've had lots of them that uh, we, you'd like the panel to consider. And some of these questions we've put together and have included in the question and answer section of the webinar. Please also use the chat room, and we'll monitor it and raise any issues during the webinar, if we can. Uh, time is our friend and also some degree our limiter um, in how many questions we can get to answer. But our, um, our panelists have sworn to short answers. So um, hopefully short and pithy answers. Um, this uh, webinar is, the, is a little unusual because it's the result of a unique partnership between the 31 Australian Primary Care Networks and the Mental Health Professionals Network, MHPN. And in a first in their history, the 31 PHNs have formed a consortium and engaged MHPN to plan, produce and broadcast webinars focusing on older persons in Australia and their mental health. And tonight's webinar is the third of the first series uh, I've facilitated the previous two, and they are available on the MHPN website. And the PHNs have agreed to continue the series due to its success. So I think for one of the webinars, we had 3,000 registrants. More webinars will be delivered in the coming 18 months. Please use the chat box to let us know what topics you might like to be covered. In previous ones, we've um, focused on a single case, uh, which is the normal format, but we felt it more appropriate to address the issue of culture in general for this one and respond to your questions for much of the webinar. So that's the sort of housekeeping, and I'd like to begin by handing over to Susan for an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'd like to start by saying Waramid, Nagaya Susan, Nagaya Gurindji Wawunga. 
Gumita Bianga, Gumita Wanga, Madamarong Tianaga Anaga, Madamarong Bealia, the Marigal Guri Pemel. Hello, I'm Susan. Um, I ask with respect and honour to speak to the male spirits and the female spirits to be able to walk and talk on the land of the Gamarigal. I'd also like to acknowledge all of you online, uh, wherever you are within Australia, that um, you are beaming in from different nations and, and homelands from across the country. And I'd like to acknowledge all of you for being here this evening and also acknowledge the different um, homelands that you are coming from. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, and by way of introduction to our topic tonight, I'd like to share with you questions that I often ask myself. I don't have an easy answer to them. What is the legacy for older people's emotional, social and physical well-being when they perhaps experience cultural disrespect and racism from our healthcare system? And how do we raise our level of awareness for the diversity of our fellow citizens and respect for their cultures and feelings? And, and these are questions that may frame our discussion tonight. Now, everyone's bios were on the uh, invitation, so I will now bring you to a picture of everyone. <laughs> we go back. There we go. So we have Susan and Samira and Ming and me. And uh, we're very lucky to have you all. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, so I might go back to Susan for the first um, answer to two broad questions. How do you engage with older people from First Nations and culturally diverse backgrounds? And are there specific issues for older people of diverse cultures? Um, I guess, thank you, Stephen. I, I guess in terms of the very multicultural nature of the original people of this land, First Nations people, and in particular older people, um, I think that the history has not been so kind to us. So as we engage in the Western health system, um, as you were talking about, there is racism and discrimination. Um, it's about how we can support people through the system to engage to get a better health service when there has been a, a history where we have been denied even our own um, rights and our identity to be seen in this country. And when we look at history in the 67 referendum and, and where that has brought us to, there is still a lot of healing to be done. There's a lot of creating a greater understanding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. We need to, to look at respect and honour that we are a very multicultural nation in, in 2021. So how can we be more accepting and, and you know, provide a service that, that's an honest service and sees all people? That's great. Thank you very much. Um, Samira, your turn next, if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, uh, put your perspective onto those two broad starting questions. Um, thanks, Stephen, and thank you, Susan, for that um, acknowledgement of country. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Yagara and Tarabal people, land that has always been a place of learning, and I owe great respect to our past and um, current and emerging leaders um, of, of our First Nation people. And I think, um, for me, very important to make that distinction in, in when we talk about multicultural because I think it's very important that when we talk about multicultural we give a special place, uh, you know, prioritised place for our First Nations people because the experiences of colonisation, exclusion and racism are different to that of the broader multicultural population. So um, my experience has been primarily working with people from migrant, asylum seeker and refugee populations. So a lot of the stories that I'll share with you today are working in that multicultural context. And I think um, what Susan shared about 
the discrimination and access issues is very much relevant as well to people who have um, traveled here from, you know, a broad range of different countries. Our health system is very complex in Australia. It, um, we have federal health system, state health system, local health systems, and um, it's really important that we take time to talk about systems, advocate within the systems, and support people to understand how to receive health services. And we also work with um, health providers to support them to understand some of the journeys in healthcare that people have experienced as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samira. Yeah, I think you raised that really important point of uh, navigation of the system. You know, we, we, we have to have the rudder and help people have the rudder so that they can navigate a very complex and, and often very user unfriendly system, particularly for multicultural citizens. So, uh, Ming, your uh, little bit about yourself and your thoughts on, on those two questions. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Following on from Susan and Samira's comments, um, I would just highlight what Samira said about the factored healthcare system, certainly from the consumer and the ethnic population's point of view. Aged care, dementia management um, has a lot of challenges, even for people of non-ethnic backgrounds. There's obviously the issue in terms of engagement, reassurance, the diagnosis, and then actually providing that support. And all of these steps, uh, if you look at the system as it is, um, be, be it between the state issues and the federal issues and on the funding, uh, splintering, if I can call it, in between. It is an incredibly complex system for anyone to navigate. And then to actually provide the specific insurance, because dementia is not one experience for one person. It, there's a multitude of different layers to it, and every family goes through it in different ways, which makes it interesting but challenging work. Um, how do you maintain the communication engagement whilst providing the reassurance is a major challenge. And it would be trite to say that it's really about having experience and an open mind. Uh, I think there are specific skill sets that we should talk about here uh, amongst the panel, the kind of things that would be relevant to help uh, ethnic communities and ethnic families navigate the terrain. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, let's, um, let's keep the conversation going. Would you, just, would you like to start us off there while, while, while that idea is fresh in our minds of, of the skill sets of what, what you expand on that a little bit more? If you, if you Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. So anyone who's been involved in dementia care, and I'm sure my co-panelists will comment on this as well, know that dementia management and, and for people who are going through this disease process need multiple teams to be involved. And that coordination of all your healthcare providers, some families can do it well and others struggle to do that. It's not a natural skill for anyone's background. Uh, and if you're from an ethnic community where language is a major issue, perhaps your understanding of uh, dementia uh, comes with stigma or comes with other preconceptions, it's very hard to engage services. And on the same token, um, every pe uh, people of different ethnic backgrounds quite understandably would feel more comfortable with people of their own backgrounds. And so to engage a system where there's a multiplicity of personnel, of different professional backgrounds, of different personal backgrounds, it can be overwhelming. So one approach would be uh, this idea of care coordination, who ends up being the care coordinator. And I would say very often it's the GP who does it very well. But then that coordination of all the other services and the explanation on how to use those services. For example, um, with no disrespect to Samira, it's often quite difficult for families to understand what is an occupational therapist, despite their very vital role. And so these are the kind of things where it becomes about media, but even just straightforward conversation and preemptive striking, if you like, to know where the potential uh, gaps may be to guide people along this journey. Yep. That leads, that, that leads straight to you, Samira. <laughs> <laughs> well, no offense taken, because um, I think one of the things we need to do as occupational therapists is really um, support people to understand what we do, because a lot of migrants, um, and people new to Australia are coming from countries where the role of occupational therapy is not yet established. And I think um, as an OT, my first session is usually about getting to know someone, 
understand their family, understand the family dynamics and what health beliefs exist in the family and then also setting up um, some agreements of how we are going to work together. And um, part of that is explaining what I can and can't do as an occupational therapist. So, um, it, it, you know, usually people are familiar with the role of the physiotherapist, the role of the doctor, the role of the nursing team. However, it takes a little bit of work and explanation and some concrete examples um, to provide to the family of, of, of what an occupational therapist can do, and um, I think being the OT in the um, multi in the interdisciplinary team for me is really important because we have a role around not only supporting that person's ability to do the things they want, need, and have to do, but it's really important to understand from a cultural perspective what happens in your family when someone has dementia. How do we care for the older people in our in in this culture? What are the social norms? And um, it's important to really start from that point of curiosity to build your understanding of how that particular family is working, what are the different family dynamics, who are the doers, who are the talkers, who's going to um, be the person that you can work with to help the family develop some self-advocacy skills as well. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think that wraparound support kind of model is, is very um, helpful when we're working with um, people from multicultural backgrounds because it allows us to start to understand what natural supports exist in that person's life as well. And um, once we're engaging natural supports, we're able to start to build a real in-depth understanding of that family's unique culture. And, and I'd mm -hmm. like to um, yeah. just add in terms of the importance of language. And and for us as as First Nations people, you know, there were hundreds of different nations and and languages. And when when a system comes in and has its own way of describing disease that you know, and, and we're looking at dementia. Um, what is dementia to First Nations communities? Like we we potentially would have had different ways of describing that. And it's it's interesting when you start to go into communities and and talk about the the different diseases. And I I was working on a project in and around dementia within New South Wales and and how people you know out there in the broader community um, viewed dementia or even thought of what what this was when you know auntie or uncle or nana or pop just started to to not remember things and. So it gets described as dementia in the Western system, but we would have other words for it and and just care for people, like caring for older people, caring for elders was a part of our culture. And and I think the other interesting thing about dementia and, and, and our communities is the work that Professor Tony Bro has been doing and, and looking at dementia within within our communities and he he was very excited about the fact that you know they were able to track it back to to um i can't think of the word but but incidences in early childhood and and the delays in development which then meant at the other end of a person's life in older age that we are more susceptible more likely to get dementia now whilst he was excited about his research i was absolutely devastated at that thought that you know a lot of our older people will end up with dementia in later life. So I wasn't so excited, um, but the research was um, interesting in how there was the interface of, of what our communities were, were, how they were viewing this disease called dementia um, through the Western lens when we, we potentially have different ways of describing what is going on for our older people. Susan, if yeah. I can pick you up on that, because I know Tony and I understand um, and this brings me to an interesting point. When we communicate in, in dementia circles, in this Western medical kind of field, if I can call it that, we tend to be very verbal, very um, specific in our language. When we talk about education of families, if you look at the Alzheimer's Australia website, it's all about text. And it's, it's, it's not really about body language. It's not really about comforting. It's not even about, uh, what can I call it, mirroring, because I know that's certainly part of the engagement when you talk to First Nations, you've got to come and mirror the body language and the tempo and the tone and set the scene more comfortably. Whereas communication for us as doctors and then Western medicine, 
tends to be very discursive and precise. And in some ways, that's even condescending, right? In, in some circumstances, it comes off as condescending. But what do you think of that? It's, it's these non-verbal communications in education and providing support. Can we talk about that a little bit, perhaps? Yeah, and, and I think that given all of the different hundreds of languages of First Nations people, that even communicating b between our nations, um, there sometimes can be a language barrier. And when we are responding to people who might have a diagnosis of dementia, I mean, I agree with you. It is all the, the, the non-verbal communication which is really important. I mean, my mum had Alzheimer's and, you know, it was, it was devastating for us to see the decline in her, but also trying to, to still communicate with her in different ways. So yes, it is touch, and and it's it's you know just the facial features and and the way in which you try to do things that um, were familiar for her, and it was it was interesting that it's the non-verbal communication and the fact that there were there were moments where she was was quite cognizant of what was going on, and then she would just be in a different dimension and and watching her decline, watching. The engagement with doctors, and you know, we, we were lucky. Tony was her her doctor um, because he went to <laughs> he ended up um, you know at school with um, with my dad at university with my dad. So it um, it was interesting to have that engagement with with Professor Bros and the research that he was doing, and then being my mum's doctor and him sometimes being surprised at what she could do when in a Western medical sense she shouldn't be able to do things. So that, that was fascinating for us and fascinating for me as a daughter. But really um, I, I think that the nonverbal is really important, the way in which we respond, the way in which um, we communicate with each other as family members and, and all of the support staff that, that go into caring for a loved one. Um, we need to remember the humanity. We need to remember to care and, and to love and to express that, even though sometimes they, they might not fully be present. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the way that, that we've always done it. You care for your older people. You care for elders. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Samira, I mean, you've been, um, in, in, when we all spoke before before the webinar a week or so ago, you work very much in teams. So can you just tell us a little bit about multicultural health workers as part of that team? Yeah, so um, I work uh, at World Wellness Group um, based in Brisbane. And um, we have a team of multicultural peer support workers. And um, they come from, we have about 60 in our team, all of whom, whom come from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds and who've had different migratory experiences coming to Australia. So um, they, we have a model in our psychological therapies program called the co-therapy model, where um, a practitioner is um, having the support of the multicultural peer support worker to provide um, a level of cultural interpretation and their expertise and supporting the practitioner to understand some of the cultural issues and the impact of the migration experience and how that affects um, mental health. So we are very lucky that we have a pool of experts in a lot of different cultures because you can't know everything about a culture. We can't always understand the right type of language to use to describe dementia in a way that is non-stigmatizing. We don't understand what certain phrases mean because it's not always easy to translate. So um, we have a beautiful co-therapy model that's been very successful and um, working with the expertise of our multicultural peer support workers has helped build our cultural capability within the organization. Um, but I really want to come back to what Susan is talking about around care and showing of empathy and being engaged from a place of what I like to call revolutionary love because that is really protective for us against, um, you know, experiencing vicarious trauma and it helps us in that whole process of um, supporting justice within the health system. 
So if we are truly into our jobs, we're having fun, we're having a good time, we're caring for the people we're working with, I think we're less likely to experience some of that compassion fatigue and burnout. And um, Vicky Reynolds has done some amazing work around this. Um, so I, I encourage you to look her up um, because she talks about justice doing. And for me, um, I, I can never know enough about different cultures in order to be able to provide a great level of care for everyone that I meet. However, people know when you care. People can feel that. That translates across cultures, across languages. So um, I think that the most important thing is care for the people you're working with and have fun at work. I think um, being you know positive about the work and the impact that you're bringing it is so valuable to that therapeutic relationship. Yeah, yeah. I wondered when someone was going to raise trauma. Mm. <laughs> and and look, you know, I, I'd like to 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 also reiterate that that um, people know when you care. People feel it. They can they can see it in your eyes. They can pick up on the energy. And and it's really important that you know when within the health system and, and all the, you know, allied health that people who are vulnerable, people who are not well, look to the professionals for that support. And and I know time is of essence and time is money and we're trying to, you know, get patients through, but really it it's about taking the time to be to be present and to have a level of empathy. Um, with whoever you're supporting and, and providing a service to. And and I just also want to say that Dala um, asked a question about, you know, how to, to learn about appropriate language and support for First Nations people. So and I know that you're, you're all coming in and, and tuning in from different places across the country. And, and one of the things that for us, we, we are very, um, you know, multicultural. We have a lot of nations and... It's really about health systems and services in the different states and territories actually having a relationship with your communities that, that live around the services. And for, for personal staff to actually have that relationship with community. So when you have events and things, invite community in. Um, we have a, dis, a different system of philosophies and health, of health and wellbeing. And, and we'll have different words across the country for different practices. And it's, it's really about trying to reveal and unearth the original health practices of this land and to get to know all of the different nations and elders, older people, and then start to work out how you can actually do this together. Um, because here in Northern Sydney, like I've, I've known Stephen for a while, and, and looking at how we've been able to embed some of the, the First Nations cultural practices of health and well-being in this area and start to use the language and start to embed some practices is, um, is actually what's important because when, when you start to, to use language and to, to incorporate our philosophies of well-being, people are then validated. They're, they're seen in the landscape, they're heard in the landscape, and that's what's important because for a long time we just weren't. So we're now getting to a point where there's a whole lot of funding in and around providing services to First Nations people. How do how do some of these organisations, hospitals, um, personnel, staff do it well? And it's about the relationship. Yeah. So yeah, it would. In, in a miraculous way, you've all answered some of the questions that have been sent in, of course, because hopefully we're all on the same page here and we're all thinking about the problems and how we can solve them, perhaps not see them as problems even. Um, so, you know, being culturally humble and practicing in a reflective way, that was one question that I think you, you've, you've all, you know, gone a long way to answer. Ming, I was going to ask you, you know, it's uh, the hospital is often the interface uh, that uh, people come to, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you could give us a few insights into uh, how hospital-based practice uh, differs from community practice, 
and community practice is much more outreach at best than mm. hospital. And I'm mm. wondering again the, the the barriers to keeping appointments, uh, follow up, continuity. How how yeah. you see that challenge in the hospital system? So a couple of points to to, to start with. I think everyone's been through the hospital system for themselves and can see it's very much uh, beholden on the user or the patient to push themselves through it. Um, communication is major, the major problem, uh, in particular in the system, which there, are, sorry, there's a, there is a hierarchy, not the same as it used to be, but every hospital has hierarchies within it and different uh, lines of communication. So, for example, something as simple as what is a registrar versus what is a consultant? How do you escalate your concerns, which come very naturally to healthcare professionals because we live and breathe this situation. When you think about it, it's actually an incredibly foreign situation to people outside. And then even the process of how do you support a patient with dementia and the myriad of issues that they present or the things that they require, um, getting that information and keeping them in that stream, getting support is incredibly difficult because the hospital system is geared towards efficiency. The tendency is to come in for for that brief moment and to be back out again and to lose contact. It's a very much a bounce off kind of phenomenon. Um, so the first thing I would say in terms of the difference is that the hospital is geared for efficiency. It doesn't in its natural form uh, provide an easy environment for people to navigate. The first word of advice I would give is to really describe to patients uh, how they can advocate this for themselves or to figure out a way that they can have advocacy, be it either through the family member, through some kind of a service, such as what Samira Samir was describing, or if it's even through the GP himself or herself, uh, you need to figure out who's going to be the co-sponsor to get them to navigate through and help them engage uh, a very challenging communication system. And, and uh, the issue of uh... Uh, keeping, is there any trick you found for uh, making sure that people uh, come back to their appointments? Because that's sort of not, not, not an easy huge idea issue. to grasp. <laughs> it is it's a huge one, isn't it? Um, the trust and, and what the, the ladies were saying before about patients knowing if you care, look, I, there's no getting around it. There's no point mm. trying to workshop it. Mm. You either care or you don't. Uh, and that comes down to us as healthcare professionals looking after ourselves. I think if I can put the, the knife into the back of our own specialty, Stephen, we tend to work ourselves too hard and we become a little bit focused. And I know there have been times when I've come close to burnout. You don't, you just don't have that bandwidth. You're not paying attention. And the experience mm. isn't quite as enjoyable. So looking after yourself and being a bit careful to know when you're in form and out of form is important. Uh, something that we talked about uh, previously uh, when we were preparing for this talk was about the feedback loop. Uh, one of the challenges is we're all going to be meeting different ethnic groups. Uh, and it's often hard to know whether you got it right or wrong. And so if you can somehow develop something in your practice so you know how the experience has gone for that individual patient, particularly if they're a new ethnic group you've not um, been involved with, or you can get some kind of feedback from the advocate or, dare I say, people, resources such as um, so Allied Health, MDTs, or even the trans translation service, I think you've got to make sure that that, that process of feedback is somehow available to you. So we, we, we might take that that uh, lead to just discuss uh, briefly the translation services or interpreting service, um, it, its strengths and its weaknesses. Susan, you're, 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 yeah, I, I'll I'll jump in. Um, I, I think that previously the system has not been. Um, responsive to First Nations needs and it it caused a, a disconnect of of our people going into the hospital system because that was a place that you would um, only go at the last resort and then people would die in the hospital and that was because of the racism that was happening and and I've heard some really horrific stories of um, the way in history how our people were treated there were things separated there were, you know, wards that were out the back and, you know, there were there were not such nice names written across the gowns and, and the cutlery and the, the crockery, um, which is a bit horrifying that it's not that long ago that this stuff was happening. How that's turned around is that these days um, you have Aboriginal health units within local health districts. 
So even here in Northern Sydney, where we have quite a low population of people who identify, um, whenever someone goes into the hospitals and and identifies when they're going either through emergency or to other ways of getting services, that um, the Aboriginal Health Unit gets notified and then they will come and be you know, an advocate, a friendly face and, and kind of be the concierge through the system, which I think for us going into, and I think for you know, a lot of people going into hospital systems, it's frightening. And, and I just, you know, I think that when our young people and when our older people um, need to kind of interface with, with those services, that um, they just need someone to just be there to shepherd them through what's necessary. And, and it is frightening for our, for our old people and our elders to go in. And, and I think sort of effort to really um, educate the system so there's not the discriminatory responses that have happened in the past, that there, there, is, there is a change that's going on and, and I can see it and I've been a part of it. And it's, um, it's good to see because our people for a long time feared the hospital. Yep, I've put in a little shout out there to the PHNs who, who really are, I think, trying across the country to, uh, to, to address these issues. Uh, yeah. Samira, you, you, you um, uh, would probably have uh, many uh, different interpreters or translators, mm -hmm. people to work with. What do you uh, feel about the system? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, we have the model where we have our multicultural peer support workers who can provide language support. And then we also do have um, access to either TIS interpreters or the Queensland Health on call interpreters. And the key thing is um, to have an understanding of best practice when working with interpreters. So um, it's important to understand um, the country that someone originates from, and that will help you build your understanding of what dialect of that particular language that person speaks. So for example, if you're working with someone from Sudan who says they speak Arabic, they're going to need a Sudanese Arabic interpreter, which is a different um, accent, a different way of speaking to say um, uh, Arabic speaker from Iraq. So it's very important to have that contextual understanding of where someone is coming from and the language and the dialect that they prefer to speak. It's also really important to um, find out about what sort of gender match is appropriate for that person when you're working with the interpreter. And it's important not to make an assumption um, about gender matching. So some men are very comfortable, sometimes even more comfortable to work with a female interpreter because they're more comfortable to be vulnerable in that space and vice versa. So every individual will have their own unique um, ideas about what sort of language support they want. Some people may want a face-to-face -face interpreter. Other people may be more comfortable with one over the phone. When we're talking about sensitive mental health issues, um, a lot of people that I have worked with have requested a phone interpreter outside of Queensland, so outside of the state that they're living in, just for that feeling of comfort and safety that it's not going to be someone that they may know from their community. Because ultimately our, um, unique, our ethnic communities are relatively small in Queensland, but everyone knows one another. And um, it's important that we provide that offering to people. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is that when you're working with the interpreter, it's really important to remember to um, give them a very brief um, overview of what you aim to do during that session and have a bit of time to debrief afterwards if possible so you can understand how the conversation went. It's particularly challenging working with interpreters when you're um, engaging with someone that may have cognitive impairment. So it's important to brief the interpreter and to make sure the interpreter is letting you know if someone is having, um, you know, difficulty understanding what you're talking about or what they're saying is not making sense. And it's important to really remain in control of the conversation. So it's a conversation between you and the person you're working with. And um, my key tip is to speak in simple English 
short, clear, one idea sentences at a time. Even break your sentences and ideas down further if you need to. And ensure that you are addressing the person directly. So instead of saying interpreter, can you tell Stephen that, you know, it's a hot day today? You just speak as though you're speaking directly. It's a hot day today. Pause. Let the interpreter take over. And it's really important for you to to continue with that throughout the conversation. So it's a conversation that feels more direct between you and that person in order to build the relationship. Otherwise, what can happen is the interpreter can take control and start to do some of the work for you. That's so interesting. Um, I mean, you've probably been through the medical system more recently than me, but this is not something that was ever taught in my medical school. Yeah, just listening to Samira, I was just thinking exactly the same thing. Even in Western Sydney, where I'd been working for many years prior to moving to the beaches, um, the communities, you'd be surprised how small they are. And even, say, Chinese communities, the networks, it's amazing how integrated they are. So you've got to be careful about diagnosis, who knows about it. And quite often translators are quite important people within their own cultural um, groups. So it can be a, a touchy-feely or challenging situation to know and talk about diagnoses. Um, I'm curious to see what all of you think in terms of this discussion, because I, I very much agree with Samira that the conversations and that skill of engaging and looking at the patient directly, talking to them, and this using the interpreter as the voice in the background, the precision of what you say becomes a challenge. And even this idea of briefing the interpreter before and debriefing, because I think is a very good one. But sometimes I wonder about how explicit I should be to the patient. There are some times when you invariably will come across a family who says, even if it's dementia, I don't want you to tell the family uh, or the patient, rather, that they have this diagnosis. And that quite often puts us as, as medical people, as us uh, health practitioners, in a bit of a bind because Western ethics is pretty clear that we have to be very transparent and very uh, earnest and explicit in what we see and what we say. And I'm just curious how, what, what the panel thinks about that, the dementia diagnosis being a classic one because obviously there's a stigma for some cultures. Do you uh, use alternative words or can do we say it once? Or what do you think is... How do you approach that problem? Um, that's well, huge. I think, <laughs> yeah, and I think it's one that's not necessarily unique to multicultural communities either. So um, the way that I've handled situations like that is worked with the family to help understand what, why, why are you afraid and address some of those issues, like taking a holistic approach, and then also... Um, trying to find words that are appropriate and non-stigmatizing in, in that person's understanding and using their level of health literacy to explain what's going on to them, uh, going on for them. Um, but yeah, I think it's very much at an individual sort of level where we need to find the language appropriate to support that person emotionally to understand what's happening with them and kind of normalize the experience, even if we don't use clinical language. As the yeah, GP and that in this group, go carry on. You, you go ahead. Me. Uh, so as, 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 as the GP here, time, you know, uh, Samira, you and your group, you you obviously take a lot of time. I'm not saying I or my colleagues don't take try and take time, but the time pressure in in the clinic is is so great, uh, and that's really where working in teams comes in, is to know that you have a team that you can politely um, uh, and respectfully suggest that they they are brought in to help because this is a, a slow and and considered process. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and shout out to the Brisbane North and Brisbane South PHA <laughs> for funding our capacity and to Queensland <laughs> Health. No, 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 no one funded is... me. Who do I tell it? <laughs> well, you have these. You, see, you specialists have these long consultations. You see. That oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what I'm going to do now, because we're just uh, coming into the last third, I think I'm just seeing where I can find the slide. It, you know, the, 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 the beloved learning outcomes that um, that all of these meetings um, enjoy so much setting up, and, and we had a part in, in setting these up. 
So looking through it, I, I think that you know we're, we're not doing too badly in in covering um, many of these uh, many of these questions. So I hope that will be reflected. But maybe just take a moment to to have a look at at what what we said you should as a as an audience be a little bit more comfortable with uh, at the end of this. But um, so. Uh, I'll take it off the screen because it's a bit proscriptive to come back to all of us. Um, so um, one question that came in, um, uh, how can religious faith be involved in counseling? Should I always refer people to their relevant religious or cultural leader when que questions of faith or beliefs arise in the counseling room? Um, how are issues of faith and spirituality addressed in your practice? We've answered that to some degree, but um, uh, I think the, the fear um, of uh, not uh, approaching uh, a client appropriately because we know nothing of their faith or spiritual beliefs and, and making a mistake that, that will damage the relationship right down the track. So um, any thoughts on that? So, so I'll jump in. Um, I, I think, again, because of the history of, of this country and the fact that, you know, our people are the, the, you know, the original people of this land, the sovereign people of this land, and a system came in and got put in over the top of what was here at the beginning, that there is, there is a, an emerging awareness of our people, our culture, and, and our practices, which I think is, is great. And previously, there was the misunderstanding, so there was the discrimination that happened because people didn't know where to go to. I think now that there are, there are more elders, elder groups, um, there is Aboriginal medical associations, there, there are a whole lot of resources now where people can actually find out um, how to engage better with our older people, with people with it's dementia, mental illness. And, and the other thing, the other point I want to make is that um, in terms of mental health, and I think it's the, the Australian Psychology Association um, a number of years back actually did a formal apology to our people to say that, you know, our psychology, the Western psychology doesn't work and has in fact made us even more unwell. Um, I think that to be aware that not one size fits all people, that there is a cultural difference, there is cultural context. Language is really important. The other thing I was gonna add before was that, you know, for some of our people and older people, English could be a fourth or fifth language. And people have to process what maybe a doctor or a counselor or, you know, a health worker is saying to them, and if they don't have someone who can interpret that for them, which is the the translation of of the Western diagnosis and and a service, then people just get really fearful because they don't understand what's going on, and and so they won't return back. So it's it's how we can make the service um, more in. I don't want to say engaging, but, but more responsive to someone's cultural, spiritual background. And if you don't know what that is, then um, seek out how to, to educate yourself better in, in being able to respond to different communities. And when I say communities, I'm talking about First Nations communities. And if people, the other thing I was just really quickly going to say, was that you know people are off country sometimes too so what makes us well as first nations people is actually being on our own ancestral homeland we get strength we get um we feel well when we're on country being off country can make us unwell so sometimes people will say you know i i'm okay i might i might physically or spiritually or mentally, cognitively be unwell, psychologically be unwell, I just need to go home to country. And that is as good as any pill, I can assure you. Being on, being on your, your ancestral lands and being with your community makes you well. 
and I would think that would be the same, correct me if I'm wrong, Samir and Ming, that would be the same for, for many, many people. Uh, it's sort of the elephant in the room, sometimes just naming that uh, before one goes into a complex psychological uh, uh, remedy, and particularly medication, just to acknowledge that you are not on your in your country, and, and of course, it may be impossible to go back to your country if you're a refugee. So, mm -hmm. Samira, you you spoke um, when we were talking before um, this webinar about a cultural capacity ladder that you use yeah. in your. Uh, and, yeah, uh, well, that that would be interesting to hear about. Yeah, well, it, it sort of picks up what you're talking about. Um, you know. The, the cultural capacity letter is how I see things in my mind and um, it's sort of about understanding that where am I and it's about reflective practice. So the first step is some level of cultural awareness. So, okay, I understand that my values, beliefs and understanding of mental health are different in this situation. The next level up is um, building cultural capacities. So you're starting to develop skills and some strategies to be able to work cross-culturally. But the top rung of the ladder is cultural humility. And that's when you've reached a point that you understand you're not going to know everything. You need people around you to support you to understand and build your capacity to be responsive. And you've developed a framework of reflective practice that um, is grounded in a value of wanting to do justice in the work that you're doing. So, so that's kind of um, how I like to think about building cultural capacity at both both an individual um, practice level and also at a more systemic organizational level. So um, when we think about how we are funded to do our work, a lot of psychological therapies across the country are not funded to work with interpreters. So this is something we need to advocate for. We need to advocate for the basic language support and advocate for doing things better. I think um, as occupational therapists, we are very lucky because our practice framework um, I'm specifically referring to the Canadian model of occupational therapy. The center of that model is spirituality. So what motivates someone? What are their beliefs? What are their um, ideas around health? This is what we define as spirituality, not necessarily religion for everyone. So it's an important conversation to have with people from multicultural backgrounds. A lot of people who come from collectivist cultures and multicultural backgrounds are very comfortable to talk about religion. I know in our mainstream Australian culture, two things you don't talk about are politics and religion, but that's not the same across different cultures and contexts. And in fact, when you're working with older people from different backgrounds, a lot of them love to talk about politics. So that can be the currency, that can be your buy-in. And it's important to ask the people around um, that person, what do they like? Um, so really understanding yep. that our framework is centered around spirituality because that influences motivation and volition. Um, I think that, that's really important. Yeah. I think we'd all like you on our team, Samira. <laughs> well, for the people, uh, a shout out to anyone from <laughs> Queensland. Um, we've set up um, a service that was born out of the COVID pandemic funded by Queensland Health and it's called Multicultural Connect Line. And we exist for the sole purpose to provide um, a pathway to culturally appropriate mental health support for people across the state. Um, and we are also able to talk to service providers and practitioners um, if they've got questions about social services, social support, and also mental health support. So mm -hmm. you can ring me on that 1300 number. Um, <laughs> perhaps we can send that around later. And I'm really happy to chat about Stuff. And Ming, do you think any of these conversations go on a lot in a hospital of this nature? Yeah, I think they do. I think most people do try. Yeah. Let's, let's, be, yeah. let's be clear. Um, yeah. The difficulty is the structure of the workflow. You know, a round happens in the morning, the family's not there, the, the consultant who directs everything disappears and goes off, off site. A lot of the communications with the allied health and the nursing unit manager on the floor doesn't necessarily happen. They don't know what's going on. So if, if you spend the time and look at it, it's just the way that we've structured our workflow and, and how our jobs work, that's the issue. Yeah. 
but people are trying to engage with that. I think um, what uh, Susan was commenting on in terms of the Aboriginal health officer, I, I had trained actually under Tony Bro for a while, many years ago, and had a very good experience about that. It's really just about co-locating a buddy of the same culture who can navigate and be the concierge, the tugboat through the stream. Uh, I think it's, it can sometimes be as simple as that. Um, mm. the, the other thing there is also the families, and I guess maybe can we maybe exploit that a little bit more and discuss that, because invariably where I've seen families who have the financial and the education and the experience to engage with a hierarchy. So, for example, I've noticed between my experience in Western Sydney versus the beaches, um, the, the clear difference is some of the families I'm meeting at, in the beaches are used to dealing uh, with advocacy. Be they a lawyer family or a business family, they know how to advocate for their, for their family. They know how to talk uh, firmly but not confrontingly, and they know how to seek advice. They know how to pick who in the in who they have met is the person with the information. When you've not come from um, the same background in, in Western sort of culture, if you like, or you're not used to big organisations and systems, it's very different. Uh, and I think a lot of hospitals are trying to engage with that in different ways, be it the size of the hospital, what kind of um, person engages with the family, and even the, the basic communication tools like do you give brochures, do you plug in mainly with the GP, or do you go specifically to the patient with some kind of care provider, be it a specific allied health worker, uh, invariably the social worker. So I think hospitals are trying. There's a lot more to be done. Um, but this is the kind of thing that we are talking about today. Mm -hmm. So it's almost time to uh, sum up in, in a sort of one-liner. We, we did have a question which is far from a one-liner, and, and that's <coughs> about stigma. Uh, as if it's, uh, So I'm, I'm going to set you a really you know, hard hard task here, but I think stigma is central to what we're talking about and, and the feelings of people coming into our health system, especially with uh, psychological, what we call mental health issues, um, mm. social and emotional, non, uh, uh, not feeling well. So um, uh, big challenge, but uh, you've got about one minute each to, uh, to sum up the uh, the challenges. I mean, you've all you've all really covered as much as one can in three quarters of an hour. The um, the uh, the field. I mean, we've we've had the we've had a conversation, which is so important. But maybe just a, a word or two on on stigma. Oh, that's no one wow. jumping on that one. <laughs> Oh, well, we're all human. That's good. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's not a stigma if you don't make it a stigma in, in the office, right? When you're talking a to them. Absolutely. And you present it. Yeah. It, it's yeah. really about showing that it isn't a stigma. Um, yeah. the, the, this, this, this stuff about, say, Chinese uh, culture, about seeing uh, dementia as maybe being normal and healthy, uh, normal yeah. expected aging versus other cultures, say, for example, Eastern Europe, that maybe the patient's malingering. I'm not sure that's entirely true. I think families and, and cultures are more heterogeneous than that, but obviously we have to be aware there can be some trends. But look, stigmas aren't stigmas if you, if you make sure that you show the patient you care and it's not a problem and that they're, they're no less a person for, for what they're going through. Uh, the only other problem that I would say in terms of delivering a potentially stigmatizing diagnosis is you don't have to necessarily deliver it right at the point of contact. Um, I've, in my younger career, often done a very hefty cognitive examination because I thought I was being a smart doctor that's a very confronting experience for most patients when they have to be exposed to a cognitive assessment. It's quite confronting and demeaning. And then to deliver them a diagnosis at the end of that in such a very taught situation is not the way to go. It's better to spread out your consultations and see them iteratively and introduce the idea in a more comforting uh, manner. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, there, the, is there the word stigma in, in other languages? Samira. I, I, I don't know because I only speak English. Um, <laughs> but but what, I, what I can speak to is that um, in, in our organization at World Wellness Group, we've done a lot of work to understand how to explain mental health in a way that's not stigmatizing. So if you look at our promotional materials, for example, for the helpline, you'll see words like stress and worry or concern that gets translated into different languages. Mm. We know we're talking about mental health issues, but we don't put it across that way because then once 
becomes an illness issue, it becomes inaccessible to a lot of people that may need help. And what we've done um, on our helpline is we've structured in um, psychosocial support and practical support. And what we find is that once we're able to offer someone a solution to a practical issue causing stress, we've built a relationship. And then that's when conversations about mental health issues start in a more natural way. So it's really about investing time to build rapport, assess someone's mental health literacy, and find the right language to describe what's going on, and find the right person in that person's um, life to talk to as well, particularly with older. Um, and I think uh, in the public chat, somebody mentioned that um, in a lot of ethnic um, communities in Australia, I'm referring mainly to our collectivist cultures that reside within Australia, there is a reverence for older people and a lot of respect and a desire for younger people to be in the caring role for older people. So it's usually very easy to find people around an older person to talk to as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, I guess my contribution to this is language is important and so you know when we're talking about the the different health whether it's physical health or mental health um, from from our perspective it's it's about social emotional well-being and there what we would also say was um, that you know this is this is one organism and and not to separate out the, the the mental health and the physical health because it all there is such an interplay that happens. So, so we we look from a more holistic point of view of of a person's um, connection and and their identity and their their whole you know social emotional well being. Um, we also in terms of First Nations philosophies around well being, um, we we look at the three worlds and we we recognize the importance of the connections of the three worlds. So there is the, the human world and it is about our physicality and, and our relationships with family and people and, and our behaviors and, and how we're meant to respond to different people. There is the, the, the environment um, that we live in and there is also the sacred world. So spirit being at the center of, of everything and recognizing that we are spiritual beings have a, having a human existence and where we are born from and where we are born into is actually important in terms of, um, you know, being a human this lifetime but having a spiritual journey. So it, it is about making sure that we, we care for all of it, our, our human, our physical and our spiritual selves. And, and it's that what I call the triangular balance that, you know, if, if all of those are in balance then we're happy and we're healthy and we're well. If if something is not in balance, then that three-legged milking stool simply falls over. So our our desire to be on country, to understand our connections as hum, humans, and also understand our cultural, spiritual ways that are important to us. So social emotional well-being, understanding who we are this lifetime. And yeah, that's that's what's yep. important. We have a lot to answer for, don't we, Ming, for the over medicalization of growing older. Yeah. You know, obviously, people we we have skills, but uh, we we can sometimes uh, not see the wood for the trees. And, yeah. Um, and I think that's that's one of the messages I hear from all of you. Um, and uh, so we've, we've certainly had a, a conversation uh, tonight, which is, uh, I think, probably uh, uh, always helpful. And um, if only we had more time for conversation in our daily work. Um, uh, I sometimes like to think of the words that you've used uh, during the, the webinar and they're always words that begin with C-O-M, uh, which is, you know, the, the Latin for with. So think words like compassion and comfort um, uh, are so, so important. Uh, it's always fun to go and Google words beginning with com and uh, carry them into the day. It's, 
it's an interesting exercise. Um, now there are resources. Let me come to come to I another think one. Samira wanted to say something. Oh, there we go. I'm not following. I'm not following my chat room. I'm bad. Sorry. Oh, I've got one eye on. I've got probably too much of an eye on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> just super quickly, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what um, Susan was talking about around um, looking after people holistically, and that is. Um, so something that we found really valuable and important is facilitating referral to other service providers in a way that you remain linked in with the person until you know they've engaged and they are well engaged with other service provider before you close them or exit them from your program. And um, I think this is something I probably should have said earlier, but this is central to a trauma-informed model. So we're not having a reliance on that person to repeat their story to every different service provider they come into contact with. And I think um, that, you know, from an OT perspective, an occupational therapy perspective, we want to provide that holistic care as well that's very much part of our framework. And um, just, uh, you know, word of encouragement to our PHN funders and listeners out there is that let's get mental health programs outside of clinical spaces, outside outside of the office into outdoor areas where people feel more comfortable, more connected to nature, more connected to, to calming sensory environments. Yeah, all right. Now I have to jump back in, Stephen, and talk really <laughs> briefly about Cabranunga, which is exactly what you're talking about, Samira. So, so with the PHN mental health money that was um, in our region in Northern Sydney, um, the Gamaragal Group partnered with Relationships Australia to dovetail Indigenous philosophies with the Western system. And, and it was exactly that. Take people outdoors, do ceremony, connect with nature and, and be with, with like-minded people and share time together. And, and that just human connection and energy being in the environment um, just allows everything to fall away. And you can just have those moments of respite from your life, um, which make such a difference. So Cabranunga is a Gamaragal word, and it means resting the mind. And it was just um, so wonderful that we were able to create something that, that brought the best of both systems together. Yep. That was well, my during, No, good. Good. <laughs> and during COVID, I, I set up a little outside working space that... Uh, Yes. Uh, was uh, uh, appropriately distancing and, and the rest of it. And people said, I don't want to go back inside again. <laughs> Can we always have consults like this? So, yeah. so I think this is a, a human desire to, to be out uh, outside. And the, and the yeah. medical system, of course, for, for obviously good reasons, um, has mm -hmm. become like a fortress. And yeah. um, let's, let's see how we can help people. So uh, the, the recommended resources, if I can move on to, to, to that, um, uh, there's one which I didn't put in there, which is Council on the Aging uh, Australia, COTA, if you Google COTA, uh, they have a, a particular uh, site, which is culturally inclusive aged care, which is, which is full of, of uh, good information. Um, uh, you'll all receive uh, follow-up communication from MHPN uh, with the recording of the activity. So, you know, maybe, maybe in your in your workplaces, uh, play it to a small group and 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 further the conversation. Uh, conversation is how things move along and how we can advocate better for change. Um, MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips, resources, build local referral, re referral pathways, and engage in CPD. So there's a list of, um, of uh, some of the networks. Uh, our one in um, North Sydney has meetings on a wide range of topics including art and music therapy, uh, multicultural issues, drug, alcohol issues, First Nations health, 
geriatrics, psychogeriatrics, and uh, and even film screenings. So uh, to all of those who are in that network, I think we've we've built up a a, a good group and look back look forward to meeting face to face if we can clear COVID out of the way. So if you're interested, please make contact with the MHPN. Uh, I think this is really important, and I'll use that word political work, is to meet in groups and promote the ideas that we're, we're talking about here and, and spread the word. And that's best done in small groups uh, and community. It's a very inclusive um, uh, network. So you don't really have to have a formal qualification in one of the, the, the is it six allied health categories or eight allied health categories that Medicare recognizes. As I say, you can be someone involved in art or music therapy um, or community leader. Um, and there are going to be um, more webinars, more and more. So this was, this was the third, um, and, and there'll be more webinars, as I said at the beginning, by way of partnership between the 31 PHNs and MHPN. Uh, keep an eye out for future communications. Uh, please fill out the exit survey. I'm not sure if that's another slide here. There we go. Yes, that's thanking. We're not quite thanking you yet, but we'll be thanking you in a moment. 